Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Paul Scott. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Paul actually grew up in Ames and went to Ames High School where he was an avid wrestler. He then got his Bachelor of Science degree in Biochemistry and Biophysics from Iowa State University and then went on to a PhD at Purdue University in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. This was followed by two postdocs, uh, one in Denmark at the Royal Veterinary and Agricultural University in Copenhagen, and then another postdoc at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And then in 1996, uh, he joined USDA and at the uh, Corn Insects and Crop Genetics Research Unit that's located on the Iowa State campus as a research geneticist. Some of Paul's other important activities include uh, serving as an editor for Crop Science. He's also a fellow of the Crop Science Society of America. And then throughout his career, he's had over 95 peer reviewed publications. Um, Paul's research is focused on genetic control of economically valuable traits, such as nutrient, nutritional value and pollen exclusion. And he works on developing new uh, varieties of specialty corn. And so with that, uh, Paul, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. That was a very nice introduction. Um, for those of you who don't know, Michelle is my boss now. And um, one thing that happens to USDA people is that um, our, the USDA administration has problems with USDA people who are stationed on campus locations because they can they get confused, their affiliations become confused. So I just wanna make it very clear that I'm not an Iowa State person and I'm employed by the USDA because my boss is introducing me. <laughs> so I wanted to make that very clear. And so what I did was I wore my, my USDA bicycling jersey today so, so that everybody's clear. So if Michelle, if you could report that I gave a seminar with the words USDA emblazoned across my chest, that would be nice. And then the other thing, so the back of my jersey is for everybody else because I don't know if you can see that. So we're gonna talk about, could everybody see that? Good, good. Okay, we're gonna talk about organic production systems today. Um, and so I guess I probably need to share my screen here. Is that something that I can do? Um, yeah. Okay, so let me just get going here. Excellent. Okay. So Zhenming, are you, can you see that? Okay. Was that a thumbs up? Yep. All right. Thank you. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about breeding corn for organic production systems. And I want to start by just talking about what certified organic means. Um, everybody kind of agrees on the basic ideas of certified organic. Um, it's their products that are produced using it environmentally friendly, sustainable practices, and food products are nutritious and healthy, free from toxins and unwanted chemical residues. These are things that everybody wants, right? Everybody can get behind this. Where it gets more complicated is when you start talking about the legal definition of what organic means. And the legal definition is contained in, uh, it's actually a federal law contained in the Code of Federal Registry and it's called the National Organic Program. And what this law indicates for the most part is a list of allowed and prohibited chemicals and practices. And these chemicals and practices are determined by the National Organic Standards Boards that makes recommendations for um, what, what is allowed. And it's a volunteer organization made up of people from all walks of life, who are interested in, you know, in the organic system. For producers, certified organic uh, means that they have to be actually certified by an accredited certification agency, and then they have to pay fees. And if they do all this and meet the requirements, then their products can be labeled with your USDA organic label. And that's good for them because organic products typically 
command a premium in the marketplace so they can make more money by selling their higher quality organic products. So my favorite organic products are far and away organic blue corn tortilla chips. I, I really love these things. And uh, they're made from corn like this corn here that was uh, developed by my, my friend Rich Pratt at New Mexico State University. And then a close second for me is um, organic eggs. I like organic eggs because uh, this, is a, this is a great picture of the difference that you can see by Walter Goldstein at Mondaman Institute. Walter put two organic eggs on top and two conventional eggs on the bottom. And you can really see the difference in the color of the yolk and the size of the yolk. So um, they're just a lot more orange and uh, full of good carotenoids and, and other nutritious pigments. So you might ask then um, what do eggs have to do with organic corn? Of course, the chickens are fed organic corn, but um, does, does that mean that organic products have to be made with organic corn? And uh, that kind of begs the question, how far back in the supply chain do you have to go for something to be considered organic? So let's take a look the, at the organic supply chain. Um, so if we look at some organic um, chicken breasts here on the, on the right, uh, the regulation is that poultry products have to be produced from poultry that has been under continuous organic management. So we're talking about things like they don't get injections of antibiotics and stuff like that. But what about their feed? Does that have to be organic? And uh, the rules say that the producer of organic livestock must provide uh, them with a total feed ration that is organically produced. So if you want to have organic chicken, you have to start with organic chicken feed. And the grain in that, in that feed has to be organically produced as well. So we can keep going back in the supply chain, right? Grain is produced from seed that farmers buy. And so does this seed have to be organic as well? And the rule says, yes, it does. The producer must use organically grown seed, except, and this is the important thing here, non-organically produced untreated seeds and planting stock may be used to produce an organic crop when an equivalent organically produced variety is not commercially available. Okay, so that is what we call the loophole. And that basically establishes where the, sub, the organic supply chain ends. Um, it's really right here at the seed, because if you don't have organically produced seed available to you, uh, you have the option to use other kinds of seed. And so if we look at what the seed options for organic producers are, you know, the, they, I think would like to have organically produced seeds of hybrids that have been tested and evaluated in organic conditions. But actually that seed really isn't available to them. There are a few companies that market a little bit of that seed, but for the vast majority of it um, is not that type of seed. So, well, maybe the next best thing is organically seed, produced seed of conventional hybrids that, uh, you know, of course, GMOs aren't allowed in organics. Um, so they'd have to be the non-GMO version, but you could produce conventional hybrids using uh, organic production management systems, right? But actually that really isn't done either. So the problem here is that organic seed, uh, corn seed is produced on inbred lines and inbred lines are really hard to grow. Um, Organic, so producing inbred lines in organic conditions is even harder. Weeds are a, a big problem. And um, the, the result is that most of the seed that's available to um, organic farmers is just untreated, conventionally produced seed of conventional hybrids that really haven't even been tested on orga in organic production systems. Um, and, and that's because of that loophole in the organic regulation that that's allowed. And it kind of, 
uh, brings up the question that, you know, do, it seems to be working okay. Are, are, are organic varieties really needed? And, you know, is there, are we missing out by not having organically produced seed of hybrids that are tested in organic locations? So I want to spend some time looking at the differences in management and uses of organic corn and try to understand if there are benefits that could be captured by developing organic corn varieties. So looking at management, um, insect management is a, is a big uh, issue in corn production. Conventional corn producers rely on GMOs and pesticides to control insects. That doesn't work for the organic system. So organic producers have to rely on biocontrol and native uh, insect resistance. I have an example here to show what native insect resistance is. This is in our organic winter nursery in Puerto Rico. And uh, they, I have these two photos taken on the same day in nearby rows. Here's a variety that doesn't have native insect resistance. You can see it's just riddled with holes from all the insect feeding. And then here's a variety that does have native insect resistance. You can see it's nearly intact. So it's a insect resistance is a big issue and uh, organic producers have to select for using genetics to control uh, insect feeding. Weeds are another issue. Conventional producers control them with herbicides. Organic producers can effectively control weeds as well using crop rotation and cultivation. So it's different practices and they can achieve the same effect, although it's more labor intensive and possibly more costly as well. Fertility is another issue that conventional people meet with chemical fertilizers. Organic people use manure and other organically approved products. Early vigor is dealt with using chemical treatments. So when you put the seed in the ground in the early spring, the conventional seed is treated with chemicals that uh, reduce the amount of fungi that attack the seed and let them to survive until they, uh, until they germinate and become independent plants. Um, organic producers really have to wait until the soil warms up and do late planting because they don't have access to these chemical treatments. There are some organic treatments, but they tend to be not as effective as the chemicals that others use. So um, let's look at some end uses as well. The main difference between organic and conventional is that nobody uses organic grain for biofuels, right? Because biofuels are, uh, nobody cares if it's, uh, you know, got harmful pesticides in it, we're just gonna burn it anyway. So, so it wouldn't make sense to treat, uh, to, to turn organic grain into a biofuel. So how big of a market is that? Well, the National Corn Growers shows us that of uh, all the corn produced in a typical year, the amount that goes into fuel ethanol is here, this big part of it which is pretty big, but then also these uh, distillers dried grains go into, that's, it's a byproduct of the feed industry that goes into the biofuel market as well. And then there's some other things that you would never use organic corn for, like high fructose corn syrup. I'm, I'm unaware of anybody producing organic high fructose corn syrup, right? That's just something that's not gonna happen. So actually the, the market for conventional corn is very different than the market for organic corn. So I'm gonna conclude then that our, uh, when we ask are organic varieties needed, I'm gonna say, yes, there are opportunities to differentiate organic corn from conventional corn and make it better suited to specific management practices and end uses. So um, I've been working on breeding organic corn varieties for about maybe 12 years now. And um, we, in order to do this, to start this program, we had to think about what management practices we're gonna use. Um, we had to think about selection targets and what breeding methods and 
keep in mind the whole time as we're talking about all these different decisions that you have to make, our competition is always going to be untreated seed of non-GMO commercial hybrids. So if we can't come up with an organic alternative to untreated seed of non-GMO commercial hybrids, it will never be adopted, right? Because this is always available to the organic farmers as an alternative. So we have to beat that or our varieties won't be adopted. And the, the bar is pretty high there, I think. It's a difficult thing to do. But let's look into these different uh, things a little more deeply. So uh, plant breeders have two main field operations. One, one is nursery and one is yield trials. So the goal of nursery is just seed production. And I guess the question is, do we wanna do our nursery seed production using organic methods? And uh, things you have to consider are the cost and the risk and the quality. Anything that increases the cost is gonna, you know, make your, increase the cost of your program. Risk, uh, this is so important that you don't wanna add risk and quality is very important. So you need to maintain high standards of quality. So my conclusion is that we, we probably don't wanna use an organic certified nursery to do this. On the other hand, we don't wanna use conventional methods either because neither one of them is really suited to organic, uh, to seed production. And what we wanna do for our nursery is um, use the best practices for nursery management, which are not organic and not conventional. But um, I think you have to do your nursery production in a way that uh, allows you to keep costs low, risks low and quality high, or you won't be able to effectively produce the varieties that you need to produce to serve your organic customers. So yield trials are kind of a different question. The goal of yield trials is um, you wanna predict the best varieties in your target environment. And our target environment is organic, uh, organic farms, right? Organic production systems. Now, um, a, a couple of things go into this prediction. So one thing is you wanna use representative environments. And so the question here is, is one organic environment representative of another organic environment to a greater extent than maybe one organic environment is representative of a, a commercial environment. And actually there's not a lot of data here. Um, so I don't think that we're in a good position to say that in order to, to represent an organic environment, you have to evaluate things in, in uh, in an organic situation. It may be that we can pull data from conventional yield trials and still that data may still benefit us in selecting hybrids in yield trials. The other aspect of yield trials that's uh, really important is they have to be reproducible. We're trying to pick the winners here, basically the best hybrids that we're gonna release. And if your reproducibility isn't high, you won't be able to pick the winners repeat, uh, reproducibly. I do have some data on comparing conventional and um, organic yield trials in terms took uh, 15 conventional tests and six organic tests that were conducted in two separate years. And I just compared uh, the CVs of those test years. So this is a measure of, of reproducibility, right? And you can see that the mean CV of the conventional trials tended to be lower than the organic trials, even if you consider this outline data point here that I don't know what happened. That was a bad year for somebody in their, in their test. Um, but it's not to say that organic yield trials can't have high reproducibility. You know, we had some that definitely had very good CVs. It's just that in our hands, well, in the hands of the people who did this test, on average, they tended to be higher. 
so I'm going to conclude that on yield trials, we don't really have enough information. And that's why I've continued to use both organic and conventional yield trials in my breeding program, because there may be value in these conventional yield trials, and they're a lot easier to do than the organic yield trials. So if we can extract value that's relevant uh, from those conventional yield trials, um, then, that, then we want to use that data. Okay, what about selection targets? This is a, an important area where organic is kind of unique. As, so farmers get paid for two things. When they take a load of corn to the elevator, the corn is evaluated for two things. It's evaluated for, uh, they get paid by the, for the amount of corn they get, right? Basically the yield. And they also get paid for how wet it is. They, they're actually, money is subtracted if the corn is too wet. It's the same for organic. So these are two traits that everybody cares about and needs to select for in a breeding program, right? But conventional breeders don't have to select for a lot of things that organic breeders do select for. So insect resistance, as I said earlier, um, early vigor, weed suppression, nutritional quality, and GMO contamination are all things that we probably need to consider in an organic breeding program. So we have a lot of breeding targets and I'm gonna talk more about GMO contamination a little bit later in the, in the talk. But the bottom line for a breeding program for having, uh, when you have all these different selection targets is, oops, um, if, if you need to select for multiple traits, it's hard for breeding because a single trait, let's say it has a normal distribution, a lot of traits do. What you try to do is you wanna have an, a high selection intensity and select things way out here on the tail and that'll give you the best rate of gain from your breeding, right? But if you do that and you need to select for two traits, that means um, if they're independent, you have two normal distributions to select from and the odds of finding something that's out here in the tails of both of these distributions is very, very low. So mathematically, um, if these traits are independent, what the way this is expressed is the population size has to be increased to uh, n to the x if you want to select with the same intensity on um, x number of traits, right? So the bottom line is the more traits you have, the the lower your rate of gain is going to be. Um, so looking at rate of gain is a good way to think about the impacts of all these things on an organic breeding program. And plant breeders have an equation to describe the, the rate of gain in a breeding program. And the things that influence rate of gain are things like heritability. So um, you know non-uniform environments are gonna make your rate of gain less. Phenotypic variants, you need to have uh, some variation to select on. Um, selection intensity is what we were talking about earlier. And, and uh, with a lot of traits, that reduces your, it's going to reduce your rate of gain. And then the time of uh, a cycle is in the denominator there. So um, when you take all these things together, I think it's a pretty safe conclusion that breeding organic varieties is possible but it's gonna cost more and it's gonna be slower than breeding conventional varieties. So that gives us a challenge, right? Because remember our comparison basis is always going to be conventional varieties. So how can we possibly keep up with the conventional breeders? Well, we need to use all the breeding tools that are available to us to do that. So um, transgenics are not allowed, obviously. Um, but cisgenics may be possible. Um, cisgenics are uh, a biotechnology product that uses uh, genes that are derived from corn in the, in the product. So that's why it's a cisgene as opposed to a transgene, right? And um, they're still being evaluated, so we don't know if they're going to be allowed in, in organic breeding programs. Doubled haploids is a great method that can really benefit a uh, breeding program. And doubled haploids are also still being evaluated by the National Organic Standards Board. The main complaint about doubled haploids is that in order to make them, 
you have to treat the haploid plants with a chemical called colchicine in order to double the genome content to produce a doubled haploid. And chemical treatments are something that the organic community is not comfortable with, right? So that's kind of what the holdup is. And fortunately, um, Thomas Luberstedt in our agronomy department, who's I think out there listening to this talk right now, um, and, and Ushi Fry from the Iowa State plant or uh, uh, doubled haploid facility have identified some genes that confer spontaneous haploid genome doubling in maize. And this is really important for the organic community for the potential for using doubled haploids, because what this does is if you can, if the genomes will double spontaneously, that means you don't have to use colchicine in the production of doubled haploids. So uh, this is something that I'm excited to work with Thomas on and trying to implement uh, this spontaneous haploid genome doubling into an organic breeding program. So we're working together on that now. And uh, it's an interesting area of research that I hope Thomas will tell us about in a seminar someday soon. Um, Genomic selection, marker-assisted selection, all these marker-based methods are fine for organic. So those are things that we can take advantage of. So in the first organic grants that we got, um, we had a uh, this complicated breeding cycle. It took us took us seven years to get through this breeding cycle, right? And um, that's kind of an old school. Corn breeding program is pretty typical of that. Um, the, we have a plan to improve on this in our latest uh, grant proposal. So this is something that we're planning to do. This is uh, Thomas and uh, Martin Bone and Angela Lerneris. Uh, Martin's from the University of Illinois and Angela's from the University of Puerto Rico. We're proposing to develop a rapid cycling population improvement program. It's patterned a little bit after the recurrent reciprocal selection uh, program that has been going on at Iowa State for many years in that you have a male population and a female population and you use them as testers for each other. So the idea is that you're designing hybrids that combine or inbreds that combine well with each other in, in hybrids. So if we just look at um, one side of this cycle, though, uh, it's very different. So if we start with um, a bunch of uh, haploid plants, our plan is to use uh, genomic selection. So we'll genotype these haploid plants and um, select the best ones uh, using a genomic selection model, just uh, you know, based on, on DNA sequences. And then the best plants will, will be recombined to make um, however many uh, F1 hybrids. And then these hybrids will be immediately uh, turned back into haploids. This is a process called induction. So the we're hoping that we can somehow do a cycle of breeding in two generations, right? Where we induce and recombine and then go around the cycle at that time. It depends a lot on uh, the pollen availability that these haploids have, but we're hoping to select for that. So anyway, this is our goal. We haven't reduced this to practice yet, but uh, we're hoping to implement that. And then the, the nice thing about using genomic selection here is that genomic selection allows you to decouple your breeding cycle from your evaluation activities, right? So you can even though uh, that your testing lags behind, you can still predict the best individuals to select. Um, and, and then your evaluation catches up as you modify your, um, your prediction model for genomic selection based on yield trial data that is lagging a little bit behind your breeding cycle. OK, so that's our plan. Um,
breeding examples. And um, I think I really don't have time to talk about breeding for nutritional quality. We don't have that much work going on in this area. So I'm just gonna skip this for now. If anybody wants to talk about that after the talk, I'd be glad to do that because um, it's a really interesting target and really well suited for organic, um, organic corn producers. But I wanna talk about uh, where most of our, of our effort is this day, improving genetic purity with pollen exclusion systems. And um, these are some corn flowers. Corn flowers come in different colors, just like other flowers. They're uh, just, the different parts of the flower are separated. They grow on different parts of the plant, right? The tassels produce pollen and the grains of pollen blow on the wind. I guess they are also carried by insects, but I think the majority of it happens by just air currents. Pollen can transfer onto the silks and then the, the nuclei the, in those pollen grains travel down the silk uh, to, to an ovary where they actually do fertilization that starts the grain development process. So that's how pollination happens in corn plants. Now, pollen can get carried a long ways on the wind. And if uh, most of the corn in the US is now GMO, and so if pollen from a GMO plant um, blows around on the wind and blows into an organic field, then transgenes can be transferred into a field that you want to be organic or GMO free. And this is a big problem, right? Uncontrolled pollination is a risk to farmers because if the, an organic farmer drives their corn to an elevator and the elevator determines that it has a high GMO content, that load of corn will be rejected and the farmer will not be able to sell it for the organic premium. So it will cost them a lot of money. The same problem exists, although it hasn't been as prominent in, in the news, with other market classes of corn. So for example, um, sweet corn, popcorn, and white corn all have problems with contamination from conventional corn. Um, popcorn actually has a system, a genetic system that can prevent this GMO contamination or unwanted pollination, I should say. Um, and, and this cross-pollination that's unwanted is controlled by a system called GA1 in popcorn. And that's what I'm gonna tell you about now. So in popcorn, it turns out that pollen from a, a dent corn variety, so normal field corn is, uh, popcorn growers call it dent corn. Um, we just call it normal corn, I guess. Um, Dent corn can't pollinate popcorn, but popcorn can pollinate itself and it can pollinate dent corn. So this is a uh, unilateral system, right? The pollen can only go one way. And there are actually two functions in this system. The one function uh, on the female side is that popcorn has a barrier in its silks that prevent pollination by normal corn pollen, right? But we know there's another function as well, and that function's encoded in the pollen because popcorn can overcome the barrier that's present in the silk, right? So overcoming that barrier is an independent function because it's something that's in the pollen. We know it has to be independent. Um, let's see, there, there's also a third allele of the GA1S system that I need to mention, which, and this tells us about the relationship between the male and female functions because the GA1M allele can pollinate popcorn. So it, can, it has the male function. It can overcome the barrier present in the female system, but it can also be pollinated by dent corn. So it lacks the female function, okay? So it's only got the male function and that's why it's called GA1M. And that's important because it shows us that the functions are genetically separable, right? So even though all these alleles are encoded in the same locus, there are different functions. And in order to make a successful pollination, uh, so popcorn pollinating popcorn, for example, 
the male and female functions have to interact. And this interaction, uh, we see it at the genetic level here. And then later on, I'm going to tell you about how this interaction might happen at the molecular level. So GA1 isn't the only system that's like this. So these systems are called gametophytic incompatibility systems, even though they're not gametophytic, they're also sporophytic because the silk is a sporophytic tissue. Um, but they, they are incompatibility systems. There's two others. Um, GA2 and TCB1 both function exactly the same. You could swap out the allele designations and they would be the same, but they're encoded at different genetic loci. So we know they're, they're independent genetic functions. So just to show how this might benefit the organic community, I just, what I did was just swap out the labels here and change, uh, popcorn for organic corn, and then this is still dent corn over here, but most of our dent corn is GMO, right? So this just shows how you would, if you could put the popcorn system into organic corn, you would block the pollination by GMO pollen and still be able to do self pollinations and do crosses this way so you can do breeding. And so this is what we're proposing to do. Um, we'd like to back cross the GA1 system, or we have back crossed it, into organic varieties so that they can exclude GMO pollen. And GA1M, I think GA1M is still on this slide, yep. GA1M is a problem um, for deploying the GA1S system in organic production systems because GA1M, if it's out there in modern GMO containing germplasm, it can overcome the barrier that we have uh, that's protecting from GMO contamination, right? So um, this is something that we need to be aware of. We need to learn more about. We don't know how widespread this GA1M allele is in the commercial germplasm, but that's something we're working on to try to understand so we can understand what the risk of uh, contamination is like. Phenotyping this trait is very difficult because you don't get the phenotype of your ear until the end of the season, right? You have to wait until pollinations are done and kernels are set. And then if you see that your ear doesn't have any grain on it, you know that you had a pollen exclusion. Uh, we'd much rather have a phenotype that we could score prior to uh, pollination and so a molecular marker is, would be really helpful in here. And that's been one of our goals in this process. And, and I'll tell you about the progress we're making toward that in a little bit. The way the system works is, it is really interesting. So in a compatible reaction, when a pollen grain lands on a silk, uh, what happens is a pollen tube grows, and this is stained with aniline blue that stains the callos in the pollen tubes. The pollen tube pretty much makes a beeline for that ovary that it wants to fertilize, right? It goes right down the transmitting track to the ovary. But in an incompatible reaction, the pollen tube doesn't grow normally. It germinates and everything on the silk, but then it wanders around. Sometimes it even leaves the transmitting tract and re-enters it. And eventually what it does is just kind of flip back on itself and, um, the, and fails to make a fertilization. So this, the behavior of these pollen tubes gives us some clues about how the system might be working molecularly. And um, about four years ago, um, Adrian Moran Lauder in my lab just worked with some data developed by uh, Mike Musinski, who used to be an ISU faculty member here, now is in Hawaii. Um, and, and she found that a, a pectin methyl esterase is expressed in the silks of GA1, and it also maps to that locus. And we found some, we characterized some alleles that allowed us to conclude that pretty, pretty solidly that uh, this pectin methyl esterase called ZMPME3 encodes the female function of the GA1 locus. And then the next year, um, Wabang Chen's group showed that there's another pectin methyl esterase at the same locus that encodes the male function of 
of GA1. And uh, Matt Evans provided more evidence with characterizing the, um, the TCB1 system, which is very similar to GA1S. So it, the molecular data now is, is pretty clear that, that two pectin methyl esterases are responsible for the GA1 uh, genotypic or uh, genetic results that we've seen. So um, yeah, the two genes responsible for GA1 are called, just to reiterate, GA1P and PME3. So now the, the goal is to try to understand how these genes function to do all of those, uh, the complicated genetics that I described earlier in the talk. So we started by thinking about pollen tube structure here. Pollen tubes contain pectin. So kind of makes sense that uh, pectin methyl esterases would be involved. The pectin is concentrated, uh, esterified pectin is concentrated in the tip of the pollen tube. The pollen tube tip is basically mostly con uh, esterified pectin. And then the pectin gets deesterified as you move back on the pollen tube. And that methyl esterification and deesterification regulates the elasticity and the extensibility of the pollen tube. So you can see how um, PME activity, because it controls methyl esterification, could control whether that pollen tube can grow correctly or not, right? That's something that kind of makes sense biologically. And then um, Researchers have shown in Arabidopsis and other systems that pectin methyl esterases and pectin methyl esterase inhibitors interact to control the level of PME activity. And so this led, led me to develop a hypothesis that um, you know, the genetic interaction between the male and female factors of GA1 reflects a biochemical interaction between the enzymes and inhibitors that control PME activity. And that's what regulates pollen tube growth. So that's what we're working on in our lab now is trying to figure out if this hypothesis, which is um, you know, probably wrong, but hopefully useful, will, um, uh, will uh, help us learn about how this works. So pectin methyl esterase genes are interesting because they encode both the active enzyme, they have a PME domain, and uh, they also have a domain that encodes a pectin methyl esterase inhibitor. So there's a proteolytic cleavage that separates these two domains, and that's what activates pectin methyl esterases. So this is a PME that happens to be in pollen. It's not associated with GA1. It's encoded in a, on a different chromosome. It's called PME10-1. And it's pretty typical of pectin methyl esterases that have been studied so far. Now, the two pectin methyl esterases that are at the GA1 locus are different than that. So they actually don't have a PME I domain. And so the model is, um, it's, it's a little harder to explain how the, the model might work, but I think it's still possible to, um, to explain how PMEI and interaction between PMEI and a PME might regulate pectin methyl esterase activity to uh, confer pollen incompatibility because in uh, Chen's paper, they showed that uh, 10 one can physically interact with Z GA1P. So it's possible that it's an interaction of this PME and this PMEI that brings the pectin methyl esterase inhibitor activity to the, um, to the, the incompatibility system. So I just want to um, summarize all this in this model. This is my favorite model. And people in my lab group will be quick to tell you that it's, it's wrong. But um, I hope that it's still useful. Uh, and 
so the way it works is that uh, these green bars are silk tissues, right? And so uh, when a pollen grain lands on a silk and makes the pollen tube, it grows down and the ovaries over here somewhere and you get a fertilization, you get a successful, a compatible reaction, right? But when you a pollen grain lands on the silk of something containing uh, a, a, the GA1S allele, so this is containing the female factor, ZMPME3, that factor somehow interferes with the growth of the pollen tube, and so you don't get pollination. So this is how incompatibility happens, right? And if you mutationally inactivate the ZMPME3, which happens in the GA1M allele, then this interaction between the pollen tube and the and the enzyme no longer happens, and the pollen tube grows normally again. Now, in say popcorn pollinating popcorn, in this case, the pollen has the male factor. And so we're proposing that the male factor is delivered from the pollen into the silk on fertilization. Um, and then that male factor interacts with the female factor to again kind of restore the balance of pectin methyl esterase activity that's required to have a successful pollination. And then of course, if the male factor lands on any other silk that doesn't have the female factor, there's nothing for it to interact with, so pollination proceeds normally. Okay, so that's our working model and Students in my lab are currently testing this model to figure out in what ways it's wrong and what ways it's right. It's a big project that we're going that we're working on. I want to talk a little bit about the genome context of GA1 because it's really interesting. Um, so this is a dot plot that shows the uh, about um, one million and a half bases around the GA1 locus. The way dot plots work is you align two DNA sequences on the horizontal and vertical axes. And then wherever there's a similarity, you put a dot, right? So if you align a sequence to itself, you're always going to get a uh, diagonal because the sequence always matches itself. And then anything off that diagonal is a repeated sequence that occurs more than one time in the sequences that you're plotting. So this is the genotype W22 plotted against itself. And you can see this square here is full of repeated sequences. And we've had a terrible time developing molecular markers for GA1. And we think that that's, it's because there might be some, some PME-like sequences in that region. So we looked at um, whether there were uh, to see if that explains why we had difficulties developing a molecular marker. So Amruta Bepat in my lab uh, looked at a bunch of sequences that have been fully sequenced. And in this diagram, only uh, the, the only sequence that has the functional gametophytic incompatibility, GA1S allele, is the top one. It's a popcorn line. And so the functional genes are shown here and here. And then all these other dashes on this, this is about uh, three megabases of genome, all these other dashes are pseudogenes. Uh, if they're this kind of greenish color, they're pseudogenes of the male factor, and then the pink ones are pseudogenes of the female factor. So you can see that popcorn doesn't have too many pseudogenes, although it does have some. When you start looking at the other genotypes, there are a ton of pseudogenes, even though no functional allele of the pectin methyl esterases are, are present in these genotypes. So B73 is a pretty typical array of, of uh, pseudogenes. And we found genotypes where the, the B73-like array is repeated twice. You can see that here, one repeat, and then two repeats. There are truncated arrays of, of uh, pseudogenes. So uh, this little array is pretty equivalent to this part of the B73 array. And then there's just different arrays altogether that are different sizes and don't match up to the arrays of pseudogenes that are present in B73. 
so you can imagine why it's so hard to to uh, make molecular markers then because any DNA sequence we can find in our uh, functional genes is present in one of the pseudogenes somewhere in the genome, uh, in this region of the genome, right? So it's almost impossible to find a unique DNA sequence that we can use for a marker um, because the pseudogenes cover all of the DNA sequences we're interested in. Okay, so GA1 and, and other gametophytic um, incompatibility alleles are uh, possibly drivers of evolution of, of maize. This is an idea that um, Matt Evans is looking into a lot. I don't know if it's originally his idea, but he's the one that I'm most familiar uh, with uh, who talks about it. Um, so the idea is that in order to, to speciate, to evolve, you have to have reproductive isolation, right? We know modern maize was developed from Teosinte in the Balsas Valley of Mexico 8,500 years ago. We know that speciation requires some kind of isolation, right? You have geographic isolation, behavioral isolation, and temporal isolation. Genetic isolation is another type of isolation that could have contributed to the, the reproductive isolation needed to, in the uh, development of maize. So it could be that these gametophytic incompatibility systems are, are important in the evolution of maize. So that's an interesting idea. And so I have a little model here to, um, to show how that might happen. So the assumption here is that you have to have the correct level of PME activity to have a successful fertilization. And if that gets out of balance, you can no longer do pollination. So that would be something that would be strongly selected against, right? Any mutation that changes your level of PME activity is going to not be successful. So a critical observation here is that every species, uh, every serial species that we looked at has a homolog of ZMPME3. And you would, looking at corn, you would say, uh, generally it doesn't have ZMPME3, right? Because that's really only present in popcorn. Most corn that we have don't, doesn't have ZMPME3. So how did corn lose that? Well, if we say the progenitor had ZMPME3, at some point that progenitor had to recruit. So this is the female function of GA1, right? At some point, the male function was recruited and when you introduce another PME to this system, then you're going to have to um, somehow have mutation or uh, recombination act events that stabilize the activity and restore the level of pectinethylesterase activity so you get a successful fertilization, right? Um, so it's, but once you have this um, pair of pectin methylesterases with the correct level of, uh, with the correct balance of, of uh, PME activity, then you have a, a reproductive isolation system where uh, these guys can no longer pollinate these guys because the PME activity is out of balance. So it's possible that that could have been a reproductive mechanism, an isolation mechanism. Now, corn, is well known for its duplication uh, and mutational uh, activity, right? There's transposons all over the place. And the PME locus seems to be, the GA1 locus seems to be a hot spot for this. And there's a lot of transposons, a lot of duplication. So I'm gonna propose in my model that when these duplicates arose, they were quickly inactivated because they led to a, an imbalance of PME activity, right? And that's what drove the development of all these pseudogenes. Every time the, the, the mutation was duplicated by transposon activity, but then quickly inactivated because it, it's evolutionarily unfavorable. So duplication and activation in modern maize eventually led to a complete loss of these two PMEs, the functional PMEs. And uh, 
you know, as that happened, the correct PME activity was somehow established in their absence. And once those PMEs are gone, then duplication can proceed without consequence, right? You can have as many duplications as you want and, um, and it doesn't interfere with PME activity anymore. And that's exactly what happened in modern maize. In popcorn, however, popcorn retained these two genes in the form of GA1. And this provided reproductive isolation that uh, may have been necessary for branching popcorn off from modern maize. So that's just a hypothesis, um, but it's interesting to think about how this gene system that we got interested in because we were hoping to make some corn that would be good for organic farmers may have had evolutionary implications in uh, the development of this important crop, corn, maize, and, uh, and popcorn. So uh, I, I think I'll just end there with uh, the easy conclusion, breeding corn for organic production systems is a good fit for public sector research programs. We have receptive customers. There's lots of research questions and it complements industry programs. Um, sorry, I, my slides are out of control. I wanna acknowledge the current members of my lad group. I tried to acknowledge students that uh, former students that contributed to the work as I went along. Uh, the work was initially started by Linda Pollock and Walter Goldstein uh, with a grant from the USDA NEFA OREI program. We had a great group of cooperators that worked for many years together. And uh, over time, the group kind of has changed. And now, uh, currently, this group of researchers, Thomas and Ushi from Iowa State and Kathleen from Iowa State, Bill from the University of Wisconsin, Martin from Illinois, and Angela from Puerto Rico are working on, we have some a couple of different OREI grants. And we've had a lot of other collaborations that have helped us with different aspects of the project as well. Um, yeah, so I wanna thank you for your attendance and I'd be happy to take any questions now. I think there's still some time. Paul, I have a question if no one, no one wants to go first or questions or comments. Um, so thanks for the seminar. I've been out of the organic business for a while. I used to work <laughs> in that world. Just, just a couple thoughts. You probably already know how I feel about this, but um, on, on your yield trial graph sharing, um, showing CVs, I would encourage you to plot repeatability. Okay. Within yeah, CV is different than repeatability. Well, repeatability is the thing you want to know. I think right. it's the best measure of the quality of a yield trial. Um, I've given talks to private companies about CVs. I mean, CVs work well if you um, have the same yield levels and the things you're comparing, but I'm sure you don't. Right. I mean, this is just a quick and dirty measure of how reproducible they are. So I'm sure we can do this better. I, I'm looking forward to having some some more data on this so we can yeah, so I, well. But I'd, I'd make the y-axis repeatability and I'm going to tell you why because I think because first of all the repeatability is a measure of how well you can see the genetics right so the whole goal of being a plant breeder is to differentiate the genetics from everything else going on in the field and I, I've always contended that's always been the problem in organics and that brings me really to the question of what is an organic environment and how is it different from a, from a normal field, right? I mean, right out in the same space, organic field here next to an inorganic one over here, looks like the same environment to me. Um, um, so anyway, I mean, I, I, I've always, not, I've not, and I, I think that'll help people understand the CV doesn't help, but I think that the repeatability will that, that these organic environments just cover up. That raised me to the third point. You left out a step in plant breeding. Oh, okay. 
um, uh, that's certainly uh, that's certainly done. Yeah, sorry, I know it's 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 not really a plant breeding step, but but I've had this conversation back in the days when they were talking about ethanol and starch. Um, um, you know, the hybrids vary in their ability to um, be digestible in an ethanol plant. I can't remember what the term is anymore. It's been a long time. I, I was in a meeting with Mike Edgerton, a big one down in St. Louis, and, and everybody in the room kept going, oh, Monsanto's breeding for starch digestibility for ethanol. So I finally right. made Mike say out loud at that meeting that they weren't breeding for that. They were placing hybrids for that. Exactly. Yep. That's the difference, right? So hybrid placement is really important, I think. And so that after, after they run their yield trials and even during some of the advanced phases of their testing, when they get the larger plots, they're, they're starting to look at how, where they place these hybrids out there in the market. And I think organics needs to take a look at that approach. Yeah, so basically that's what's happening today in the organic community is they'll uh, you know, take all their conventional hybrids and test them in an organic system if they do good in, our, in an organic system, they call it organic. But you know that's a problematic approach as well because of the reasons you mentioned earlier about environmental uh, representation. Does one organic environment represent all others? Right. I would contend they could be. You could follow off on where they're already placed in conventional hybrids from a regional point of view and learn from that. But I think the other advantage of hybrid placement is they always run them in much larger sizes than small plots. I think small plots are the problem in organics. And if they can, you, could, if you can scale up the strip trials in the organic systems, then you'll start getting a lot better data. Even in conventional systems, the data quality is way better from a strip trial than it is from a small plot trial. Right. Yeah, that's, that's hard. It's expensive to do yeah. strip trials. I mean, no conventional hybrid goes to the market without being in a strip trial. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, you got to do it, right? If you're yeah. going to anyway, be competitive. That's all I wanted to say. Nice seminar, though. Thanks for, thanks for doing that. Oh, thanks. Thanks for your comments. Well, I, I also had a question. It's kind of a weird question. So I, I came across a paper uh, recently, and they were looking at repeated genes. And what they were doing is using uh, gene editing to knock out different combinations of repeated genes in a block. And I was wondering if you considered targeting this cluster of genes to see if you could come up with even better alleles or combinations as kind of a reverse approach to what you're doing. And genome editing being somewhat more accepted than, than GMOs, that it might give you new alleles that would give you some insight into to what's going on. Yeah. Um... I, I think what you're saying is that, you know, it might be possible to eliminate a lot of these repeats if we if we had a good reason to do that, right? Yeah, and like, like and from what I understand is like the way that they did the genome editing, they make the 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 editing specific for a repeat, and then within different lines from that in different progeny, you would get different numbers of of still functional parts, non functional parts, gene numbers. And then could you get novel alleles that you that you haven't seen yet? Yeah. So that it might be possible to do that in in this system. The only negative consequence that I'm aware of. So keep in mind that the ones the lines that have a bunch of repeats in them are are non-functional. They don't have the allele we're interested in. Um, so they're not doing anything other than taking up space in the genome. Um, I would like to use a method like that to remove uh, zean genes. That would be something that would be really interesting, right? Zean genes are anti-nutritional factors that are in gene clusters like this. So it's yeah. a good idea. It, it's Tom Clemente at the University of Nebraska. And I think he was working, it was either, usually he works in soybean, but it was either sorghum or... Um, Oh, I can't think of what the other crop is. Um, Amaranthus, that's what it mm. is. 
and, and, and that it had something to do with digestibility and, and, and taking out this gene cluster to improve that digestibility and different variants and seeing what the response was. But it was a pretty cool study to, to show how it works and how you could get all these different variants to figure out what would maybe be the best variant for, for what you needed. The other question I had was, have you looked at like, because to, to me, like I look at the story that you have and it looks like a lot like S locus incompatibility where you have small genes, you have clusters of genes and have you made any, could that give you any information into your model of, of what's going on by, I mean, it's a slightly different system, but there's so many hallmarks that are the same. Right, yeah, I mean, you can definitely learn from other systems and, and the other thing is, you know, these pectin methylesterases are certainly only part of the story. There's many factors that contribute to pollen growth, you know, calcium levels and other things. So it's definitely not the whole story. And there may be other enzyme systems that are involved as well. So we need to pay attention to those self incompatibility systems. And, uh, and, and there are similarities uh, that I think we can learn from interactions of uh, interactions of two gene products are often involved in compatibility systems because you know that's what you're looking at it takes an interaction to have compatibility mm -hmm. does anybody else have any questions for Paul okay hello Paul uh, you mentioned uh, supply chain that you said you described that uh, as a loophole, but let's say if you want to fix that loophole somehow, but how many generation or how many season ago you want that to stop? Because I think, you know, this is the, not only on the seed and plant side, but also on the chicken egg side, right? You have to stop somewhere, right? Because you can't tra trace back forever, right? What, what do you think? Yeah, that's a great question, Jian Ming. Um, and I think, there are members of the organic community that think that the two processes, developing organic corn and conventional corn, should be different from the beginning. It's two separate industries, two set, you know, everything's independent and there's no mixing. Um, that, that's what it would take to go all the way back to the beginning. I don't know how important it is to go all the way back, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think on the one hand, it's, it's nice to think that all your, your whole supply chain is organic, but if having your whole supply chain be organic limits your ability, your ability to produce organic products, then it really doesn't help, right? So I think there are practical limitations. Um, I think you wanna, you need to be able to have a functional breeding program uh, that produces the kinds of products that you're interested in. Okay, so then then you you, you describe those two major steps, and then Kendall added another three trial test. Let's say, could we could we say that if you just focus on the you know the testing part, right? Any any uh, conventionally bred hybrids, if you just test uh, the performance under the organic system, and then if you you know discover some of the suitable hybrid that you know then you just need to reproduce the uh, both inbred parents and also produce the hybrids uh let's say you can wait you, you can go through the inbred for two cycles of seasons then you know you have to stop somewhere right and then to to like this the, the, you know wash off or cleaning the system or somehow and then just 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 find the best match out of the conventionally bred uh, hybrids. Is that working or not? Yeah, I mean, I think that's basically what Kendall was talking about when he was talking about hybrid placement, right? There, you, you can screen conventional hybrids and pick the ones that do the best. And actually, you know, so that's something that you could do. And it, not very much of it is done, actually. A little bit of it is done, but not very much. And then there's all kinds of um, compromise systems that you could take. Maybe you select for one or two generations in organic conditions instead of, you know, the whole life of the, the breeding program. 
So yeah, there's a lot of options, a lot of ways to do it. Yeah, and, and, and uh, also follow Kendall's question on your CV and repeatability. You know, I think maybe if you test enough hybrids under conventional environment, no, uh, the under the regular conventional environment or organic environment, you could produce these reaction norms of those hybrids under conventional uh, versus organic. And then, you know, the, the genomic selection, everything else could be used to guide you to, uh, you know, to, to narrow down the selection pool of this conventional produced and then to be finally tested under the organic environment. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great idea, Zhen Ming. If you, could, if you could understand how the conventional environments relate to the organic ones, then you can use the conventional data more effectively, right? And it can help you select what's going what's gonna to work in organic conditions. Um, yeah, if, if you can ac accumulate more, you know, more data, you know, 15, six, you know, six versus six, or somehow, you know, we can actually help you to understand that react norms to that, to see if there's a pattern or not, right? It, it's going to be chaotic, but we can keep looking, yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea, Zhen Ming. I mean, I'm sure this data is not worthless, right? There's some relationship between conventional and organic systems. If nothing else, they both get the same rainfall, you know, if you're in a field what half is conventional and half is organic you know there's things like that that are the same this same hours of daylight that kind of thing yeah thank you anybody else have any questions for paul hi paul that was a great speech. I, I, I kind of had a background question. It's just kind of curiosity of just in regulation. Is there like a middle ground in between GMO and organic? Like, can you be unable to become certified organic, but also not a GMO? Yeah, there's all kinds of, I mean, you can, pretty much everything you can imagine happens. So there are market classes called GMO free. There's no organic requirement. It just has to be, you know, free of GMOs. Pretty much anything that you can differentiate people uh, that has value, people will figure out a way to capture that value, right? So um, there are a lot of organic producers. Well, there are a lot of producers that meet the organic requirements, but don't go through the certification process. So that's a kind of co uh, compromise system like what you were talking about, right? It can't be called certified organic, but it's certifiable organic. And people talk about certifiable organic products as well, almost as a, a market class. And then there's also, um, you know, it takes three years to transition a piece of ground from conventional to organic. And so you have things that are produced on transition ground. So you have products that are produced in transition to organic. So there's all kinds of uh, combinations that, uh, that people use, that people talk about. Good question. Anybody else with questions? Yeah. Paul, I also got stuck on this slide with all of the different pseudogenes and how you can't make a marker. Have you considered like expression markers like on the silks? Because none of, only the two make active genes, right? Everything else doesn't get transcribed. Could you do something like gene expression so you don't have to wait till the end of the season to look at your corn cobs? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a great idea, Jamie. And um, it turns out there's some cool stuff that goes on. Like we noticed in our nursery that when we pollinate silks with compatible pollinations, the silks die at a different rate than, uh, than they do with incompatible pollinations. So that's a marker that we sometimes use, but I don't know how reliable it is. Um, and, 
and you can definitely do like an RT-PCR expression analysis of, of the silk and that would work. The only thing about that is um, we should ask a plant breeder, uh, what do you think about me going into your nursery and clipping half the silks off so I can measure the RNA before you make your pollination? Would anybody mind if we did that? <laughs> No, I, I meant know, after I your pollination so that you wouldn't have to wait till the end of the season. If you don't have to deal with those, harvest those plants. Yeah, so, so the silks are pretty dead after the pollination. They die within a few days. Gotcha. They die within a few hours if it's a compatible reaction actually. So I don't know if you could recover RNA from a dead silk tissue. I don't want to. I, it, it might be possible, you know, they can get DNA out of dinosaur bones, right? But um, yeah, it might be worth looking at. So did the silks die to prevent at any other pollen from landing and pollinating? So it, is, it would be like a defensive sort of like defense to cause the silks to die? Oh, that's a tough question, Michelle. I, I don't know why a silk dies uh, or not, I, but I know that um, Multiple pollinations are possible. So probably it's not to present, prevent multiple pollinations. I guess my thought is that um, there's no, silks are a, a fragile tissue, right? They're hanging out there in the open air where it's hot and dry and they're full of water. And um, it's difficult, I think, for, for silks to, to stay alive, right, in, in those conditions. So I think they don't stay alive any longer than they have to. Once they're pollinated, they dry up and are gone. Okay. Any other questions for Paul? Paul, when you were generating that uh, hypothesis or diagram that very elegant have multiple rows of yes or no, uh, did you consider the process of the mitosis of the pollen itself that happened somewhere in the process? You're talking about this one? Yes. You, 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 you use a pollen instead of the, using the uh, male uh, gamete, right? You, right. The nucle nucleus to, do, to, to have a go, you know, to go through a mitosis process to have the double fertilization happen. Do you actually think about what that's going to come into play or not actually so you're talking about the fertilization process that happens yeah so um no 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 it's it's a mitosis so that you you produce two nuclei to right oh oh right 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 yeah mm -hmm. but okay yeah so the two nuclei are produced in the pollen grain prior to it landing on the silk right Okay, I don't know that, but you said, yeah, if that's the case, yeah, okay. I would bet somebody in the seminar knows that, but Mike, I believe that there, I, I believe you can follow pollen nuclei down a um, pollen tube and there's two of them. Oh, uh, okay. So I think mitosis happens before you get- I, I, I think I saw the, some diagram that was uh, in the pollen tube. <laughs> I might be wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, and I, I don't have a lot of confidence to say that um, it doesn't happen in the pollen tube. It could be. So your, but your, 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 your diagram, your mechanism is more in the t t pollen tube growth. So that, that's okay, yeah. Right, we're looking at pollen tube growth. Okay. And I mean, it's a very oversimplified process. Any questions? All right, and let's go ahead and thank Paul for, for speaking for us today. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It was nice to talk to you today. Mm -hmm.